Hello, everybody. <clears throat> I'm Dagmar Sternad, and I want to show you some of my work on prediction ac predicting actions and interactions. And I'm taking on the human perspective. As you can see from my affiliations, I'm not a straightforward computer scientist at all. In fact, I'm a movement scientist with an interdisciplinary appointment. And my interest is in how the human, the human brain controls movements, which implies predictions all over the place. So let me begin with, hang on, why is it not changing? With a human robot interaction scenario, that is probably the dream of every roboticist or computer scientist of a human competing at a world-class level in table tennis. Now, this is easily seen to be too good to be true. It is clipped together and the robot moves too fast, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, it does, I don't I, I want to highlight <clears throat> that in this perfect human robot interaction, both the robot and the human needs to predict. Robots need to predict humans, but humans also need to predict robots. And the question is, how good are humans to predict robots or how good are humans to predict in the first place? So my main message is just to put it bluntly ahead of time is that prediction is a multifaceted process and pervasive for interactions, but also actions without the interaction. And then prediction is hard, not only for humans, or not only for robots, but also for humans. So with this preamble, I give you more details on this blunt message with project one, which is a developmental project where we look at interception of a ball <clears throat> as a developmental process and show that the ability to predict in humans develops until age 11. A second project looks at the continuous interaction with a complex object, a cup with a ball rolling inside, and show that to cope with unpredictable dynamics, humans make object dynamics more predictable. Project three, we'll look at actions, no interactions per se, namely postural adjustments when catching a ball and show that postural balance relies on predicting self-induced perturbations. Let me begin showing catching, intercepting a ball here with two healthy children to highlight in this slow motion how the hands need to predict the ball to enclose it and how also the posture of the little boy uh, is adapted to safely catch the ball. On the other hand, a child with autism is seen in its attempt to catch a ball unsuccessfully, painfully, un unsuccessfully so. And indeed, there is several lines of work that have shown that autism is a disorder with predictive impairments. So we'll return to that later, but we begin with a developmental study on healthy humans. Here, the our human subjects, um, children, as well as adults, um, interact with a ball here shown on the screen, the yellow, yellow ball, the yellow dot flying, and then the child has to catch the ball with a handheld uh, table tennis racket that online controls the basket shown on the straight screen. This is only one game. But before I show you the games in more detail, here is a parallel study that is a field experiment that tested the very same games that I'm gonna show you in the Museum of Science in Boston, where we could recruit 442 individuals between the ages of five and 92 years of age. So five virtual games that we designed in order to um, evaluate how good is an individual at prediction. And as I said, we look at children and adults here. 
The game is as follows. We launch the ball on the left. It is occluded by one or three trees, one to three trees. And the basket, which is online controlled by the table tennis racket, is uh, meant to catch the ball. The error is the distance of that red dot in the middle of the basket and the contact of the ball with the basket. A slightly more advanced prediction game. In fact, we call it post-diction because here the interception of the ball trajectory is not only at a given position, but the racket also needs to be at a certain velocity at contact in order to ensure the ball bouncing off into the crocodile's mouth. We also have more controlled tasks that look at spatial and temporal prediction in isolation. So the yellow ball here is launched hidden behind the house and the subject has to press a button to stop the ball when it reappears in the hair cross of the window. We then measure the temporal error between when the ball was stopped and when the ball uh, would have been in the hair cross. The last prediction game is below, where again, a ball is launched hidden behind the gray house, and it can then land either at the top red mouse, middle green or bottom blue. And without time constraints, the subject has to predict which of the three windows the ball will land by pressing one of the three colored buttons. For comparison, we have a reaction time game where again the subject holds the table tennis racket that manipulates a basket and upon appearance of a mouse uh, the subject has to as fast as possible lift the racket no prediction it is reaction so let's take a look at the results measuring laboratory and museum data the catching error is our main dependent measure. And as mentioned, it's the distance between the ball contact on the racket and on between the center of the basket. So let me spend some time on explaining this data. Here is age of the individuals on the x-axis and the error of hitting, catching the ball on the y-axis and we grouped all our individuals into three groups. These are the young ones, seven to nine, the middle ones, nine to 10, and the oldest children group. And here are the adults, college age students. Now we compared when, which of those groups and how they compared to the adult performance. And here, as in many subsequent uh, data sets, we see that there is a decrease in error, improvement in prediction, up until the age of 11, where the difference is no longer significant to the adult group. The museum data with many more subjects essentially show the same thing. Here we first only look at the same age groups as in the laboratory and can show again that the age group of 11 loses a significant difference to the grown-ups. Looking at the entire age range here, we had larger age brackets and showed that the age bracket 10 to 19 is no longer different from this older group and the rest of the group. Meaning the conclusion is that catching error declines with age and reaches adult level, uh, adult level at approximately 11 years. Catching error as one quantification of the ability to predict. Let's move on to our crocodile game, which I call post-diction, which is significantly more um, difficult. And these two data sets between the children and the 20-year-olds in both laboratory and museum show that at nine to 10 years, 
subjects reach the level that will not improve anymore, which was also seen in the um, larger scale, leading us to conclude that this catching error declines until nine to 10 years, and then there is no further improvement. And reason being that this game is actually pretty hard. Now, here is the uh, temporal prediction game where only the temporal error is measured. And to cut a long story short, we did the same analysis on the timing error here. And the groups of 11 to 10 year olds were no longer different from the adult groups in the laboratory, in the museum, and then in a slightly a more coarse grained fashion in all of the ages uh, collected at the museum. The last spatial prediction game again shows a very similar set of results. Here our, um, success, our uh, dependent measure is success rate in percent. So this success rate improves again to 11 to 12, which is no longer different in all of our three different ways of analyzing. So the upshot is that prediction develops, it's an, it matures up until the age of 11. There is some noise in the background here. Can somebody turn the microphone off? Are where you don't actually share the control of the. Okay, thank you. Um, in contrast, we looked at reaction time with the game that I, I explained. Reaction time is the temporal difference between the appearance of the onset of the target and the onset of the movement. And this very visibly and significantly declines with age. However, this age group, 11 to 12, is still significantly different from the adult group, again, in all the different data sets that we see, which makes us conclude that reaction time declines with age, but it matures for a longer time, at least to the age of 15. And this is actually consistent with other reports in the literature that have shown maturation of reaction time up until the age of 20. So prediction is different and it matures at age 11 while reaction time improves until 15. But now given our four prediction games, we also ask the question, is this development uniform for all four different predictive aspects. Our four tasks were designed to test different aspects of prediction. And so we correlated the different um, results, rank ordering our participants, and you see complete absence of prediction here. So if you are good at one game, you're not necessarily good at another game. A little more in the two button press tasks. But specifically, this lack of correlation made us think, are different, are there different aspects of prediction? We call them dynamic prediction, post-diction, spatial and temporal prediction. So this is food for thought due to the lack of correlation that we observe here. Now, let me switch gears, project two, now continuous interaction with dynamically complex objects and all these flexible, deformable, fluid objects are complex, dynamically complex objects. We want to look at the cup of coffee. Carrying a cup of coffee is a nonlinear object with highly unpredictable dynamics as is shown in slow motion here. And then the question is, how can humans control an essentially unpredictable object. Error corrections, observing the swapping of the coffee to the rim are way too slow in the human 200 milliseconds. Um, so spilling would be a, a conclusion, given, given conclusion. So the hypothesis that we have is that humans make these interactions with this complex object predictable. 
So how do we do this? We take the object and make it a very simple one. A cup of coffee becomes an arc with a rolling ball inside. <clears throat> and this actually is modeled as a cut with a pendulum where we only show the pendulum bob in its circular arc on a virtual screen where the subject holds a robotic manipulandum that moves the cup, i.e. the cut, and the ball rolls according to the forces that are exerted onto the object. Here are the equations of motion. So in order to first understand that unpredictable dynamics, as it turns out, chaos in the coffee cup, we do inverse dynamic simulations where we simulate our parameterized cup and calculate the forces that would be needed to generate a sinusoidal cup movement shown here and here. This is the ball as it oscillates in the cup when the cup is moved back and forth at a certain frequency. Now doing inverse kinematics to produce this perfect sinusoidal cup movement for these given initial conditions creates or generates extremely complex interaction forces. Slightly different initial conditions here generate much easier, um, but still not simply periodic, simple periodic input. Now, if we do a inverse dynamics for desired outcome, sinusoidal cup motion, we fix frequency, velocity, amplitude of movement and sweep through all initial conditions, we actually get this type of outcome where we param um, we plot, we sorry, we strobe the force at the peak of the cup movement and then project it to get a marginal distribution for this initial condition, which we then plot here as this marginal distribution. Down here, we do this for all different initial conditions. And you can see that this mm, bifurcation diagram appears, essentially telling us that, yes, indeed, there is chaos in the coffee cup. Chaos is unpredictable. However, there are simple interactions like here, initial conditions that make the interactions more simple, and more predictable. And this is what we test in our subsequent experiment, where here the subject moves the cup with the ball inside, and we're asking the subject to move it around to find initial conditions before a metronome paces the cup and moves at a given amplitude back and forth. We had 11, um, sorry, 13 participants, each of them, um, executes 120 trials, 15 seconds each paced by a metronome at 0.6 Hertz. Our overall hypothesis is that humans seek predictability in their interactions with a complex object. So what we did first is we just focused on the steady state movement back and forth, not steady, yeah, kind of steady state movements, after the onset of the periodic um, sinusoidal back and forth movements. And we determined mutual information between the input force of the human and the ball and the cup phase. And the mutual information over 120 trials increases as we show here. This was shown in previous work and has shown us that indeed, with practice, humans make these interactions more predictable. But now we're asking in addition, how do they do this? Number one, by setting the right favorable initial conditions, by shortening transients, and by establishing a stable steady state. Three hypotheses. So 
Hypothesis one subjects converge to initial conditions that simplify subsequent interactions. And here we have the initial ball angle over the 120 trials, subject averages, and indeed there's an exponential approach towards a given uh, initial condition of the ball. Initial angle and velocity is not as near as uh, succinct. The second hypothesis is that subjects shorten the transients after the exploration to reach a steady state faster, and the transient duration that we quantified also indeed um, declines with trial. And the last hypothesis is that subjects increase stability and predictability of the steady state. And stability, we estimate it by the variations, by the variability of the relative phase between the cup and the ball. And these standard deviations indeed decline after the beginning and settle to a more stable and hence predictable steady state. So we did inverse dynamics just one more time on the, this parameterized um, cup. And we have a slightly different um, bifurcation diagram, initial angle. And then we plotted our initial angles as a histogram below. And you can see that at this narrow waist of these uh, marginal distributions, there are the initial conditions, however, not exactly favor, um, focused, but greatly overlapping. So from there, we go one step further and we do forward simulations with a very simple control input, this force interaction, which is a simple impedance controller with a sinusoidal desired cup movement and fixed parameter stiffness and damping that then controls the cup to move back and forth. And with this, we can actually now predict, now experimentally or scientifically predict where um, our movements should be to have short transients and stability. So we use the initial conditions of the system, initial ball angle, initial ball velocity, to predict transient duration in this forward a dynamics model. And the best case is the bright yellow. And the data show that this is indeed where the subjects are. And similarly, we do the same simulations to predict the standard deviations of relative phase. And the yellow is where the optimal conditions are and the subjects indeed are clustered there. Each subject here, by the way, is also represented by an arrow with the arrowhead always showing the direction of the most predictable, most stable and shortest transient type of performance. So in the interest of time, I just quickly say that we tested alternative hypotheses and none of them explained our results, effort, um, smoothness and risk. So let me one more time move to this um, fake movie and show you how Tim Ball, uh, Timo Ball, German record table tennis player, performs these extremely fast actions, hits the ball, but here he's losing his postural control. And here even more so. So this is a topic of an action, postural balance in the face of fast arm movements, which is another case where we need to predict. And to I, um, show this, I have a very simple model of a human standing. And our task is to look at individuals, children in this case, that hold a bar and raise both straight arms from a downward position all the way up to a vertical position as fast as possible. And we then measure the center of pressure, center of mass, in order to see how well they maintain balance under these fast arm actions that create 
very, very significant perturbations to postural balance, as this video shows you. This is a relatively slow arm lift, and down here is the center of pressure, which is moving back and forth in the two dashed lines, which are still within the base of support. However, with a fast action shown here, the center of pressure moves way outside the base of support, which means that the human needs to predict the perturbation that he, she induces herself due to this action to preempt what is going on, to preempt loss of balance. So to do, to examine this, we go back to our cohort of autistic children because autistic children, as we showed in other work and other people as well, have predictive challenges. So how does this play out in maintaining postural control? We have two cohorts of participants that perform this action, namely standing on a force plate, there's a drum roll, cue signal, and then they raise their arms as fast as possible. To begin, both cohorts had the same reaction time and no difference, no significant difference in movement time. However, if you looked at their center of pressure on the force plate, neurotypical children had a relatively straightforward trajectory of their center of pressure, whereas autistic individuals showed high variability before, during, and after the action. We quantified the directional variability with Shannon entropy, which plots in certain time bins the directions of the velocity as a circular histogram, and low entropy is little variability, high entropy is high variability. And here the last results showing neurotypical children and ASD autistic children in five phases of this very simple arm raise action, where there's a slight disadvantage already in the preparation phase. And during three, the lift in the middle and the end shows how um, autistic individuals are far more variable in their ability to maintain balance, which is part of their, um, their coordination problem. So to conclude, to summarize, prediction is ubiquitous and multifaceted. Prediction is hard for humans, not only for robots and computer scientists. So the first study showed that humans develop predictive ability until age 11. And there is food for thought that there might be actually different aspects of prediction. The second project, Interaction with a Cup of Coffee, showed that to cope with this unpredictable dynamics, humans make object dynamics more predictable. And lastly, the postural adjustment when catching a ball require prediction because postural balance relies on predicting self-induced perturbations and discoordination as, for example, autistic children display may be due to a prediction problem. So with this, I conclude with many, many thank yous. So my lab, many people participated in this research and specifically for project one and three, I want to thank Siwang Park, who is now at UT San Antonio, and Pavan Sinha, who is in brain and cognitive science at MIT. And of course, all the wonderful funding agencies. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that really fascinating talk. Uh, I think we have time for a quick question or two from the audience, either virtual or in person. Uh, 
I see a hand from Mario. But let's uh, let's do Mario first. Hey. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Dagmar. Can you hear no. me? Yes, I can. A uh, great presentation, by the way. Amazing. Really interesting work. Um, the first project, actually, I'm quite interested in. So you discussed um, prediction and reactivity. So it's quite interesting how they develop at different ages. And I assume that reactivity declines with age after a certain age. What about pr uh, prediction? Does that remain fairly constant? And what, so that's my first question. And the second question is, what are the implications of reactivity in robotics, in, in human robot collaboration? We know prediction is important, but what about reaction times, assuming that robots are speed limited? Um, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so um, you're quite right to your first point. Reaction time declines with age and like everything. <laughs> and um, there is multiple, multiple publications that have demonstrated how older people start, start to slow down in their reactions. We couldn't fully see that in our sample because our older people were the distribution of age was a little thin in the older ages because it were ch essentially children games. And at the museum, uh, it was parents and grandparents occasionally that came not enough to really make a statement here. But that said, in prediction, but neither in reaction, we could find any significant um, deterioration. So in reaction time has been demonstrated. Predictive ability to my knowledge has not yet quantified in, in this way that we have been doing. So I don't think there is an answer to, to that question. Mm, okay. So the second question about reaction, I think you're quite right that this workshop, of course, is fully concentrated on prediction for good reasons, but reaction in the human is also pretty limited. So uh, the reaction times, again, is an old paradigm and known for ages. Uh, auditory reaction time is about 150 milliseconds visual reaction time 200 milliseconds but mind you these are times that are done with key presses the person sits comfortably mm -hmm. and there is no real perturbation no real coordination problem other than uh, flexing your index finger so reaction times do go up with more complex movements i'm not aware at this point how I've seen uh, that demonstrated in single finger flexion and elbow and full arm, but I haven't seen reaction time explicitly tested um, with a full body action, just the way I was, um, uh, we were doing, but with children. But my hunch is given the increased challenges, how let's say an arm lifting action has on postural balance that the human trades off the need for prediction with a slowing down of the reaction. I imagine this, um, this would, uh these times would change too when a human develops muscle memory from doing a particular action over and over. Yeah, um, yes. Again, I can't point you to something exact, but if there's a new action required, there is a hint of a connection, even though the literature generally deals with reaction time, namely, the time that a signal is sent firstly into the muscles and then results in behavior as something largely distinct, but there is, there is a connection. But again, I, I need to be, I need to remain foggy about this. Sorry about that. Thanks. For Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much for all the questions. Uh, unfortunately, for the sake of time, we have to move on. But if you have any further questions, you can just post them in the chat directly, uh, specifically directly